Chapter twenty nine of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stondal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter twenty nine. The first promotion. He knew his age. He knew his department and he is rich the forerunner julian had not emerged from the deep reverie in which the episode in the cathedral had plunged him when the severe abbe pirard summoned him monsieur the abbe chabernard has just written in your favour i am on the whole sufficiently satisfied with your conduct you are extremely imprudent and irresponsible without outward signs of it however up to the present you have proved yourself possessed of a good and even generous heart your intellect is superior Taking it all round, I see in you a spark which one must not neglect. I am on the point of leaving this house after fifteen years of work. My crime is that I have left the seminarists to their free will, and that I have neither protected nor served that secret society of which you spoke to me at the confessional. I wish to do something for you before I leave. I would have done so two months earlier, for you deserve it, had it not been for the information laid against you, as the result of the finding in your trunk of Amanda Binet's address. I will make you new and Old Testament tutor. Julien was transported with gratitude, and evolved the idea of throwing himself on his knees and thanking God. He yielded to a truer impulse, and approaching the Abbe Pirard, took his hand and pressed it to his lips. "'What is the meaning of this?' exclaimed the director angrily, but Julien's eyes said even more than his act. The Abbe Pirard looked at him in astonishment, after the manner of a man who has long lost the habit of encountering refined emotions. The attention deceived the director his voice altered. Well, yes, my child, I am attached to you. Heaven knows that I have been so in spite of myself. I ought to show neither hate nor love to any one. I see in you something which offends the vulgar. Jealousy and calumny will pursue you in whatever place providence may place you. Your comrades will never behold you without hate, and if they pretend to like you, it will only be to betray you with greater certainty. For you there is only one remedy. Seek help only from God who, to punish you for your presumption, has cursed you with the inevitable hatred of your comrades. Let your conduct be pure. That is the only resource which I can see for you. If you love truth with an irresistible embrace, your enemies will sooner or later be confounded. It had been so long since Julien had heard a friendly voice, that he must be forgiven a weakness. He burst out into tears. The Abbe Pirard held out his arms to him. This moment was very sweet to both of them, Julien was mad with joy. This promotion was the first which he had obtained. The advantages were immense. To realise them, one must have been condemned to pass months on end without an instant solitude, and in immediate contact with comrades who were at the best importunate, and for the most part insupportable. Their cries alone would have sufficed to disorganise a delicate constitution. The noise and joy of these peasants, well fed and well clothed as they were, could only find a vent for itself, or believe in its own completeness, when they were shouting with all the strength of their lungs. Now Julien dined alone, or nearly an hour later than the other seminarists. He had a key of the garden, and could walk in it when no one else was there. Julien was astonished to perceive that he was now hated less. He, on the contrary, had been expecting that their hate would become twice as intense. That secret desire of his, that he should not be spoken to, which had been only too manifest before, and had earned him so many enemies, was no longer looked upon as a sign of ridiculous haughtiness. It became, in the eyes of the coarse beings who surrounded him, a just appreciation of his own dignity. The hatred of him sensibly diminished, above all among the youngest of his comrades, who were now his pupils, and whom he treated with much politeness. Gradually he obtained his own following, it became looked upon as bad form to call him Martin Luther. But what is the good of enumerating his friends and his enemies? The whole business is squalid, and all the more squalid in proportion to the truth of the picture. And yet the clergy supply the only teachers of morals which the people have. What would happen to the people without them? Will the paper ever replace the curé? Since Julien's new dignity, the director of the seminary made a point of never speaking to him without witnesses. These tactics were prudent, both for the master and for the pupil. 
but above all it was meant for a test. The invariable principle of that severe Jansenist Pira was this. If a man has merit in your eyes, put obstacles in the way of all he desires, and of everything which he undertakes. If the merit is real, he will manage to overthrow or get round those obstacles. It was the hunting season. It had occurred to Fouquet to send a stag and a boar to the seminary, as though they came from Julien's parents. The dead animals were put down on the floor between the kitchen and the refectory. It was there that they were seen by all the seminarists on their way to dinner. They constituted a great attraction for their curiosity. The boar, dead though it was, made the youngest ones feel frightened. They touched its tusks. They talked of nothing else for a whole week. This gift, which raised Julien's family to the level of that class of society which deserves respect, struck a deadly blow at all jealousy. He enjoyed a superiority consecrated by fortune. Chazelle, the most distinguished of the seminarists, made advances to him, and always reproached him for not having previously apprised them of his parents' position, and had thus involved them in treating money without sufficient respect. A conscription took place, from which Julien, in his capacity as seminarist, was exempt. This circumstance affected him profoundly. So there is just past forever that moment which, twenty years earlier, would have seen my heroic life begin. He was walking alone in the seminary garden. He heard the masons who were walling up the cloister walls talking between themselves. Yes, we must go. There's the new conscription. When the other was alive, it was good business. A mason could become an officer then, could become a general then. One has seen such things. You go and see now. It's only the ragamuffins who leave for the army. Anyone who has anything stays in the country here. The man who is born wretched stays wretched, and there you are. I say, is it true what they say, that the other is dead? Put in the third mason. Oh, well, it's the big men who say that, you see. The other one made them afraid. What a difference! How the fortification went ahead in his own time! And to think of his being betrayed by his own marshals! This conversation consoled Julien a little. As he went away, he repeated with a sigh, Le seul roi dans le peuple a garde la mémoire. The time for the examination arrived. Julien answered brilliantly. He saw that Chazelle endeavoured to exhibit all his knowledge. On the first day the examiners, nominated by the famous Grand Vicar de Frilair, were very irritated at always having to put first, or at any rate second on their list, that Julien Sorel, who had been designated to them as the Benjamin of the Abbé Pirard. There were bets in the seminary that Julien would come out first in the final list of the examination, a privilege which carried with it the honour of dining with my Lord Bishop but at the end of a sitting dealing with the fathers of the church, an adroit examiner, having first interrogated Julien on St. Jerome and his passion for Cicero, went on to speak about Horace, Virgil, and other profane authors. Julien had learnt by heart a great number of passages from these authors, without his comrades' knowledge. Swept away by his successors, he forgot the place where he was, and recited in paraphrase with spirit several odes of Horace at the repeated request of the examiner. Having for twenty minutes given him enough rope to hang himself, the examiner changed his expression, and bitterly reproached him for the time he had wasted on these profane studies, and the useless or criminal ideas which he had got into his head. "'I am a fool, sir, you are right,' said Julien modestly, realising the adroit stratagem of which he was the victim. This examiner's dodge was considered dirty, even at the seminary, but this did not prevent the Abbé de Frilair, that adroit individual, who had so cleverly organised the machinery of the Besançon congregation, and whose dispatches to Paris put fear into the hearts of judges, prefect, and even the generals of the garrison, from placing with his powerful hand the number 198 against Julien's name. He enjoyed subjecting his enemy, Pirard the Jansenist, to this mortification. His chief object for the last ten years had been to deprive him of the headship of the seminary. The abbé, who had himself followed the plan which he had indicated to Julien, was sincere, pious, devoted to his duties, and devoid of intrigue. But heaven, in its anger, had given him that bilious temperament, which is by nature so deeply sensitive to insults, and to hate. None of the insults which were addressed to him was wasted on his burning soul. He would have handed in his resignation a hundred times over. But he believed that he was useful in the place where providence had set him. I prevent the progress of Jesuitism and idolatry, he said to himself. At the time of the examinations, it was perhaps nearly two months since he had spoken to Julien, 
and nevertheless he was ill for eight days, when on receipt of the official letter announcing the result of the competition, he saw the number 198 placed beside the name of that pupil whom he regarded as the glory of his town. This stern character found his only consolation in concentrating all his surveillance on Julien. He was delighted that he discovered in him neither anger nor vindictiveness nor discouragement. Julien felt a thrill some months afterwards when he received a letter. It bore the Paris postmark. Madame de Renal is remembering her promises at last, he thought. A gentleman who signed himself Paul Sorel, and who said that he was his relative, sent him a letter of credit for five hundred francs. The writer went on to add that if Julien went on to study successfully the good Latin authors, a similar sum would be sent to him every year. It is she. It is her kindness, said Julien to himself, feeling quite overcome. She wishes to console me. But why not a single word of affection? He was making a mistake in regard to this letter, for Madame de Renal, under the influence of her friend, Madame Derville, was abandoning herself absolutely to profound remorse. She would often think, in spite of herself, of that singular being, the meeting with whom had revolutionized her life, but she carefully refrained from writing to him. If we were to talk the terminology of the seminary, we would be able to recognize a miracle in the sending of these five hundred francs, and to say that heaven was making use of Monsieur de Frilair himself, in order to give this gift to Julien. Twelve years previously, the Abbe de Frilair had arrived in Besançon with an extremely exiguous portmanteau, which, according to the story, contained all his fortune. He was now one of the richest proprietors of the department. In the course of his prosperity, he had bought the one half of an estate, while the other half had been inherited by Monsieur de Lamont. Consequently, there was a great lawsuit between these two personages. Monsieur le Marquis de Lamont felt that, in spite of his brilliant life at Paris and the offices which he held at court, it would be dangerous to fight at Besançon against the Grand Vicar, who was reputed to make and unmake prefects. Instead of soliciting a present of fifty thousand francs, which could have been smuggled into the budget under some name or other, and of throwing up this miserable lawsuit with the Abbe Frilair over a matter of fifty thousand francs, the Marquis lost his temper. He thought he was in the right, absolutely in the right. Moreover, if one is permitted to say so, who is the judge who has not got a son, or at any rate a cousin, to push in the world? In order to enlighten the blindest minds, the Abbe de Frilair took the carriage of my lord the bishop, eight days after the first decree which he obtained, and went himself to convey the cross of the Legion of Honour to his advocate. Monsieur de Lamont, a little dumbfounded at the demeanour of the other side, and appreciating also that his own advocates were slackening their efforts, asked advice of the Abbe Chelon, who put him in communication with M. Pirard. At the period of our story, the relations between these two men had lasted for several years. The Abbe Pirard imported into this affair his characteristic passion. Being in constant touch with the Marquis's advocates, he studied his case, and finding it just, he became quite openly the solicitor of M. de la Mole against the all-powerful Grand Vicar. The latter felt outraged by such insolence, and on the part of a little Jansenist into the bargain. See what this court nobility, who pretend to be so powerful, really are, would say the Abbe de Frilair to his intimates. M. de la Mole has not even sent a miserable cross to his agent at Besançon, and will let him be tamely turned out. None the less, so they write me, this noble peer never lets a week go by, without going to show off his blue ribbon in the drawing-room of the keeper of seal, whoever it may be. In spite of all the energy of the Abbe Pirard, and although M. de la Mole was always on the best of terms with the Minister of Justice, and above all with his officials, the best that he could achieve after six careful years was not to lose his lawsuit right out. Being as he was in ceaseless correspondence with the Abbe Pirard in connection with an affair in which they were both passionately interested, the Marquis came to appreciate the Abbe's particular kind of intellect. Little by little, and in spite of the immense distance in their social positions, their correspondence assumed the tone of friendship. The Abbe Pirard told the Marquis that they wanted to heap insults upon him till he should be forced to hand in his resignation. In his anger against what, in his opinion, was the infamous stratagem employed against Julien, he narrated his history to the Marquis. Although extremely rich, this great lord was by no means miserly. He had never been able to prevail on the Abbe Pirard to accept even the reimbursement of the postal expenses occasioned by the lawsuit. He seized the opportunity of sending five hundred francs to his favourite pupil. M. de la Mole himself took the trouble of writing the covering letter. This gave the Abbe food for thought. One day the latter received a little note, 
which requested him to go immediately on an urgent matter to an inn on the outskirts of Besançon. He found there the steward of Monsieur de la Mole. Monsieur le Marquis has instructed me to bring you his carriage, said the man to him. He hopes that after you have read this letter, you will find it convenient to leave for Paris in four or five days. I will employ the time in the meanwhile in asking you to be good enough to show me the estates of Monsieur le Marquis in the Franche Comte, so that I can go over them. The letter was short. Rid yourself, my good sir, of all the chicanery of the provinces, and come and breathe the peaceful atmosphere of Paris. I send you my carriage, which has orders to await your decision for four days. I will await you myself at Paris until Tuesday. You only require to say so, monsieur, to accept in your own name one of the best livings in the environs of Paris. The richest of your future parishioners has never seen you, but is more devoted than you can possibly think. He is the Marquis de la Mole. Without having suspected it, the stern Abbe Pirard loved this seminary, peopled as it was by his enemies but to which for the past fifteen years he had devoted all his thoughts. M. de la Mole's letter had the effect on him of the visit of the surgeon come to perform a difficult but necessary operation. His dismissal was certain. He made an appointment with the steward for three days later. For forty-eight hours he was in a fever of uncertainty. Finally he wrote to the M. de la Mole and composed for my lord the bishop a letter, a masterpiece of ecclesiastical style, although it was a little long, it would have been difficult to have found more unimpeachable phrases, and once breathing a more sincere respect. And nevertheless this letter, intended as it was to get Monsieur de Frilair into trouble with his patron, gave utterance to all the serious matters of complaint, and even descended to the little squalid intrigues, which, having been endured with resignation for six years, were forcing the Abbe Pirat to leave the diocese. They stole his firewood, they poisoned his dog, etc., etc., Having finished this letter, he had Julien called. Like all the other seminarists, he was sleeping at eight o'clock in the evening. "'You know where the bishop's palace is,' he said to him in good classical Latin. "'Take this letter to my lord. I will not hide from you that I am sending you into the midst of the wolves. Be all ears and eyes. Let there be no lies in your answers. But realise that the man questioning you will possibly experience a real joy in being able to hurt you. I am very pleased, my child, at being able to give you this experience before I leave you, for I do not hide from you that the letter which you are bearing is my resignation. Julien stood motionless. He loved the Abbe Pirat. It was in vain that Prudence said to him, After this honest man's departure, the Sacre Coeur party will disgrace me and perhaps expel me. He could not think of himself. He was embarrassed by a phrase which he was trying to turn in a polite way but as a matter of fact he found himself without the brains to do so. "'Well, my friend, are you not going?' "'Is it because they say, monsieur,' answered Julien timidly, "'that you have put nothing on one side during your long administration? "'I have six hundred francs.' His tears prevented him from continuing. "'That also will be noticed,' said the ex-director of the seminary coldly. "'Go to the palace. It is getting late.' Chance would so have it that on that evening— the Abbe de Frilair was on duty in the salon of the palace. My lord was standing with the prefect, so it was to Monsieur de Frilair himself that Julien, though he did not know it, handed the letter. Julien was astonished to see this abbe boldly open the letter, which was addressed to the bishop. The face of the grand vicar soon expressed surprise, tinged with a lively pleasure, and became twice as grave as before. Julien, struck with his good appearance, found time to scrutinize him while he was reading. This face would have possessed more dignity, had it not been for the extreme subtlety which appeared in some features, and would have gone to the fact of actually denoting falseness, if the possessor of this fine countenance had ceased to school it for a single minute. The very prominent nose formed a perfectly straight line, and unfortunately gave to an otherwise distinguished profile a curious resemblance to the physiognomy of a fox. Otherwise this abbe, who appeared so engrossed with M. Pirard's resignation, was dressed with an elegance which Julien had never seen before in any priest, and which pleased him exceedingly. It was only later that Julien knew in what the special talent of the Abbe de Frilair really consisted. He knew how to amuse his bishop, an amiable old man made for Paris life, and who looked upon Besançon as exile. This bishop had very bad sight, and was passionately fond of fish. The Abbe de Frilair used to take the bones out of the fish which was served to my lord. Julien looked silently at the abbe, who was re-reading the resignation, 
when the door suddenly opened with a noise. A richly dressed lackey passed in rapidly. Julien had only time to turn round towards the door. He perceived a little old man wearing a pectoral cross. He prostrated himself. The bishop addressed a benevolent smile to him and passed on. The handsome abbe followed him, and Julien was left alone in the salon, and was able to admire at his leisure its pious magnificence. The bishop of Besançon, a man whose spirit had been tried, but not broken by the long miseries of the emigration, was more than seventy-five years old, and concerned himself infinitely little with what might happen in ten years' time. "'Who is that clever-looking seminarist I think I saw as I passed?' said the bishop. "'Oughtn't they to be in bed, according to my regulations?' "'That one is very wide awake, I assure you, my lord, and he brings great news. It is the resignation of the only Jansenist residing in your diocese. That terrible Abbe Pirat realises at last that we mean business.' "'Well,' said the bishop, with a laugh, "'I challenge you to replace him with any man of equal worth, and to show you how much I prize that man, I will invite him to dinner for to-morrow.' The Grand Vicar tried to slide in a few words concerning the choice of a successor. The prelate, who was little disposed to talk business, said to him, Before we install the other, let us get to know a little of the circumstances under which the present one is going. Fetch me this seminarist. The truth is in the mouth of children. Gillian was summoned. I shall find myself between two inquisitors, he thought. He had never felt more courageous. At the moment when he entered, two valets, better dressed than Monsieur Valenay himself, were undressing my lord. That prelate thought he ought to question Julien on his studies before questioning him about Monsieur Pirat. He talked a little theology and was astonished. He soon came to the humanities, to Virgil, to Horace, to Cicero. It was those names, thought Julien, that earned me my number hundred and ninety-eight. I have nothing to lose. Let us try and shine. He succeeded. The prelate, who was an excellent humanist himself, was delighted. At the prefect's dinner, a young girl who was justly celebrated, had recited the poem of the Madeleine. He was in the mood to talk literature, and very quickly forgot the Abbe Pirat and his affairs, to discuss with the seminarist whether Horace was rich or poor. The prelate quoted several odes, but sometimes his memory was sluggish, and then Julien would recite with modesty the whole ode. The fact which struck the bishop was that Julien never deviated from the conversational tone. He spoke his twenty or thirty Latin verses, as though he had been speaking of what was taking place in his own seminary. They talked for a long time of Virgil or Cicero, and the prelate could not help complimenting the young seminarist. You could not have studied better. My lord, said Julian, your seminary can offer you a hundred and ninety-seven much less unworthy of your high esteem. How is that? said the prelate, astonished by the number. I can support by official proof just what I have had the honour of saying before my lord. I obtained the number 198 at the seminary's annual examination, by giving accurate answers to the very questions which are earning me at the present moment my lord's approbation. Ah, it is the Benjamin of the Abbe Pirat, said the bishop with a laugh, as he looked at M. de Frilair. We should have been prepared for this, but it is fair fighting. Did you not have to be woken up, my friend, he said, addressing himself to Julien, to be sent here? Yes, my lord, I have only been out of the seminary alone once in my life, to go and help Monsieur the Abbe Chat Bernard decorate the cathedral on Corpus Christi Day. Optime, said the bishop. So it is you who showed proof of so much courage by placing the bouquets of feathers on the baldachin. They make me shudder. They make me fear that they will cost some man his life. You will go far, my friend. But I do not wish to cut short your brilliant career by making you die of hunger. And by the order of the bishop, biscuits and wine were brought in, to which Julien did honour, and the Abbe de Frilair, who knew that his bishop liked to see people eat gaily, and with a good appetite, even greater honour. The prelate, more and more satisfied with the end of his evening, talked for a moment of ecclesiastical history. He saw that Julien did not understand. The prelate passed on to the moral condition of the Roman Empire, under the system of the Emperor Constantine. The end of paganism had been accompanied by that state of anxiety and of doubt, which afflicts sad and jaded spirits in the nineteenth century. My lord noticed Julien's ignorance of almost the very name of Tacitus. To the astonishment of the prelate, Julien answered frankly that the author was not to be found in the seminary library. "'I am truly very glad,' said the bishop gaily. "'You relieve me of an embarrassment. I have been trying for the last five minutes to find a way of thanking you for the charming evening which you have given me, in a way that I could certainly never have expected. I did not anticipate finding a teacher in a pupil in my seminary.' 
although the gift is not unduly canonical, I want to give you a Tacitus. The prelate had eight volumes in a superior binding fetched for him, and insisted on writing himself on the title page of the first volume a Latin compliment to Julien Sorel. The bishop plumed himself on his fine Latinity. He finished by saying to him in a serious tone, which completely clashed with the rest of the conversation, Young man, if you are good, you will have one day the best living in my diocese, and one not a hundred leagues from my episcopal palace, but you must be good. Laden with his volumes, Julien left the palace in a state of great astonishment as midnight was striking. My lord had not said a word to him about the Abbe Pirat. Julien was particularly astonished by the bishop's extreme politeness. He had had no conception of such an urbanity in form, combined with so natural an air of dignity. Julien was especially struck by the contrast on seeing again the gloomy Abbe Pirat, who was impatiently awaiting him. Quid tibi dixerunt? What have they said to you? he cried out to him in a loud voice, as soon as he saw him in the distance. Speak French, and repeat my lord's own words without either adding or subtracting anything, said the ex-director of the seminary in his harsh tone, and with his particularly inelegant manners, as Julien got slightly confused in translating into Latin the speeches of the bishop. What a strange present on the part of the bishop to a young seminarist, he ventured to say, as he turned over the leaves of the superb Tacitus, whose gilt edges seemed to horrify him. Two o'clock was already striking when he allowed his favourite pupil to retire to his room after an extremely detailed account. Leave me the first volume of your Tacitus, he said to him. Where is my Lord Bishop's compliment? This Latin line will serve as your lightning conductor in this house after my departure. Eret tibi, feeling me, successor meus tanquam leo querens quem devoret. For my successor will be to you, my son, like a ravening lion seeking someone to devour. The following morning Julien noticed a certain strangeness in the manner in which his comrades spoke to him. It only made him more reserved. This, he thought, is the result of M. Pirard's resignation. It is known over the whole house, and I pass for his favourite. There ought logically to be an insult in their demeanour. But he could not detect it. On the contrary, there was an absence of hate in the eyes of all those he met along the corridors. What is the meaning of this? It is doubtless a trap. Let us play a wary game. Finally the little seminarist said to him with a laugh, Cornele e Tacity, opera omnia, complete works of Tacity. On hearing these words they all congratulated Julien enviously, not only on the magnificent present which he had received from my lord, but also on the two hours' conversation with which he had been honoured. They knew even its minutest details. From that moment envy ceased completely. They courted him basely. The Abbe Castaned, who had manifested towards him the most extreme insolence the very day before, came and took his arm and invited him to breakfast. By some fatality in Julien's character, while the insolence of these coarse creatures had occasioned him great pain, their baseness afforded him disgust, but no pleasure. Towards midday the Abbe Pirat took leave of his pupils, but not before addressing to them a severe admonition. Do you wish for the honours of the world, he said to them, for all the social advantages, for the pleasure of commanding pleasures, of setting the laws at defiance, and the pleasure of being insolent with impunity to all? Or do you wish for your eternal salvation? The most backward of you have only got to open your eyes to distinguish the true ways. He had scarcely left before the devotees of the Sacre Coeur de Jesus went into the chapel to intone a te deum. Nobody in the seminary took the ex director's admonition seriously. He shows a great deal of temper because he is losing his job was what was said in every quarter. Not a single seminarist was simple enough to believe in the voluntary resignation of a position which put him into such close touch with the big contractors. The Abbe Pirat went and established himself in the finest inn at Besançon, and making an excuse of business which he had not got, insisted on passing a couple of days there. The bishop had invited him to dinner, and in order to chaff his grand vicar de Frilair, endeavoured to make him shine. They were at dessert when the extraordinary intelligence arrived from Paris that the Abbe Pirat had been appointed to the magnificent living of N, four leagues from Paris. The good prelate congratulated him upon it. He saw in the whole affair a piece of good play, which put him in a good temper, and gave him the highest opinion of the Abbe's talents. He gave him a magnificent Latin certificate, and enjoined silence on the Abbe de Frilair, who was venturing to remonstrate. The same evening my lord conveyed his admiration to the Marquise de Rubempré. This was great news for fine Besançon society. 
they abandoned themselves to all kinds of conjectures over this extraordinary favour. They already saw the Abbe Pirat a bishop. The more subtle brains thought M. de la Mole was a minister, and indulged on this day in smiles at the imperious airs that M. the Abbe de Frilair adopted in society. The following day the Abbe Pirat was almost mobbed in the streets, and the tradesmen came to their shop doors when he went to solicit an interview with the judges who had had to try the Marquise's lawsuit. For the first time in his life he was politely received by them. The stern Jansenist, indignant as he was with all that he saw, worked long with the advocates whom he had chosen for the Marquis de la Mole, and left for Paris. He was weak enough to tell two or three college friends who had accompanied him to the carriage whose armorial bearings they admired, that after having administered the seminary for fifteen years, he was leaving Besançon with five hundred and twenty francs of savings. His friends kissed him with tears in their eyes and said to each other, the good abbe could have spared himself that lie. It is really too ridiculous. The vulgar, blinded as they are by the love of money, were constitutionally incapable of understanding that it was in his own sincerity that the abbe Pirat had found the necessary strength to fight for six years against Marie Alacoque, the sacré coeur de Jésus, the Jesuits, and his bishop. End of chapter 29